Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Kelleher and Holland's final employment law lunch and learn series webinar for 2023. I'm Amy Rizzo, the marketing manager and today's webinar moderator. As promised last week, today's special episode will take a deeper dive into one of our most popular topics, paid leave, specifically the new Illinois and Chicago laws and how they may affect you. Today, we have a full hour for discussion, and if you have been loyal viewers of our series, you will recognize today's panelists from our employment law practice group, Andy Bowling and Madeline Kelleher. Please submit any questions you may have during the presentation through the Zoom control panel using the Q&A button. We will try to get to them at the end, but if time is tight, we will follow up with you online, offline. So Madeline, let's revisit the Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act. What's the purpose of the act and what does it change? Thanks, Amy. Yeah, so on March 13th of this year, 2023, Governor of Illinois, J.B. Pritzker, signed the Paid Leave for All Workers Act. This act is the first statewide paid leave law in Illinois, which mandates paid leave for all employees to, or for employees to use for any reason of their choosing. The new act, including the paid leave accrual requirements, will take effect January 1st, 2024. So this means that prior to January 1st, 2024, all, and I emphasize all Illinois employers, should review their current policies and procedures for compliance and take ne the necessary actions that must be done in 2023. The act will require every Illinois employer to provide each of their employees up to 40 hours of paid leave or 40 hours or more of paid leave for every 12 month period and an accrual rate of one hour of paid leave for every 40 hours worked. So employees may use paid leave for any reason of their choosing, meaning reasons for paid leave include illnesses, vacation, care of a family member, etc. While on leave, employees must be paid their normal hourly rate of pay. For employees who are regularly paid gratuities, gratuities <laughs> or commissions as part of their pay, their pay rate may be, must be at least minimum wage in the jurisdiction of their employment. And so that's does, pretty much a little synopsis of what the Paid Leave for All Workers Act is. So Madeline, does this decision apply to all employers? Yes. Uh, notably, the act defines employer um, in, to include an, an, any individual, partnership, association, corporation, limited liability company, business trust, employment and labor placement agency, and even includes the state of Illinois and local governments, as well as any agency and political subdivision thereof. However, and spoiler, spoiler alert, if your company has a sufficient nexus with the city of Chicago, you will be subject to the more generous leave laws under the city law. And we'll talk about that more later in detail in the program. So Andy, what about employees? Well, generally, yes, all employees, with very few exceptions, are covered. If you have one employee, assume that the new Paid Leave Act applies to you. It does not distinguish between part-time, full-time, or seasonal employees. This means that employers of day and temporary laborers, or even nannies or babysitters, are not exempted from providing them with paid leave under the Act. And also a reminder back to our program on the Day and Temporary Labor Services Act and the risks of joint employment in some situations, uh, it could be very complicated for these transitory short-term employees or workers. Now, there are some categories of workers who aren't covered, and this would include individuals who are legally qualified as an independent contractor and a few categories of employees who are working under a legitimate or bona fide collective bargaining agreement and state and federal government employees. Now, these groups of people are excluded because the law assumed that these people already enjoy more generous rights under their various collective bargaining agreements than the law requires. 
Now, there's a question about remote employee coverage. In other words, if you have a business in Illinois, but you also have employees in a facility across the Mississippi River in Iowa, or just north of Illinois and Wisconsin, does the law apply to them? Probably not, but it can get complicated. And this was especially vexing for us and for our clients in the months immediately following the publication of this new law. However, last month, our State Department of Labor, which is the agency responsible for enforcing and regulating the Paid Leave Act, issued new proposed regulations that will implement and help explain just what the Paid Leave Act means and requires. Now, these regulations won't be finalized until early 2024, and they are still, as we speak today, subject to public comment and hearings but they are the best information we have to work with right now. And I'll try to explain what the current standard is. Generally, if you primarily perform work in Illinois and reside in Illinois, you are going to be protected by the paid leave statute. So if you're the Illinois employer near the Wisconsin border and you have employees who live in Wisconsin, but work every day in Illinois, they are probably protected under the law, just as they are protected under various other Illinois laws, including the Illinois Wage Payment and Collection Act, which is a law that the state will be borrowing from and using as a baseline in certain gray areas. Um, it also indicated that if you work for an Illinois employer, but you primarily work and live outside of Illinois, you're probably not protected. Now, there's a formula that has been devised to determine if an employee primarily performs their work in Illinois. And it's a multi-factor test that I'll try to summarize as follows. It involves the ratio of work performed in the state of Illinois versus outside the state, and whether the work performed in Illinois is either isolated, temporary, or transitory. In other words, do you come to Illinois maybe just two or three weeks a year for sales meetings or for training, but spend the rest of your time elsewhere, probably not performing work in Illinois. And whether the work you perform outside of Illinois is similar to what you do in Illinois. So those are the three standards that are used. So what happens if an employer already provides paid leave? Well, I'm going to alert this audience today about a potential trap for employers under this law. The law says if you already offered paid leave that is equal to or greater than the minimum requirements of the act, you really don't have to do anything. However, I think this is misleading because you have to make sure not only that you provide at least 40 hours of paid leave to your workers, but you also allow them to take this paid leave for any reason. And this is the big catch because most companies currently have vacation or other PTO policies that require some measure of advance warning or notice before you are authorized to use that time. And under the Paid Leave Act, there's different levels of advance notice that uh, an employer can expect. In other words, if you're going to uh, have a planned vacation, you should, you know, it's reasonable to ask, for example, for a week or two advance notice. But if you're taking time off because your child is sick, and you need to stay home to care for them, you only have to give notice as soon as possible, which would mean the same day. And a lot of vacation policies aren't designed to cover that. So the odds are um, you will probably be best served if you update and modify your existing provisions. And so I would urge everybody listening to this webinar 
to take a careful look at their current policy to make sure that it will conform with all of the requirements of the act after January 1. It's a good warning, Andy, thank you. Can employer choose to provide employees with more paid leave or provide their employees with paid leave at a different rate than provided under the act? Well, the answer is kind of yes and no. Yes, if you wanna be more generous, if you want to offer 80 hours of paid leave for any reason, you're free to do that. This law is merely a floor below which no employer can go. And you can also pay employees more than what is legally required. But as a general rule, you need to uh, compensate employees at their regular rate of pay for any time taken under paid leave. You can't penalize an employee and pay them less than their regular hourly rate, for example, if they go on paid leave. And, um, and, and again, this goes back to, and we'll talk more about this later in the program, but I think at the end of the day, separating paid leave from a company's general PTO or vacation policy will be easier to manage and companies may find a way to actually save a few bucks by doing so. And I'll kind of leave that teaser there uh, subject to explanation later in our program. Great. So <laughs> Madeline, can you explain how accrual works under the act? I absolutely can. Um, just as everybody's for a forewarning, I am working from home today, as you can hear, and I do have a dog who just probably saw a squirrel or a little chipmunk outside. So <laughs> forewarning that might be in the background. So how does accrual work under the act? So there are two ways that you can comply with the act in this for accrual. It, an employer can either front load the leave at the beginning of the year or have employees accrue leave over time. I'll explain both options and firstly addressing the accrual method. So an employee will accrue paid leave time based upon the number of hours worked. Again, like I said earlier, at a rate of one hour of paid leave for every 40 hours worked. And then that's up to a maximum of 40 hours paid leave that an employee can accrue and use over a 12 month period. So while a full-time worker will likely accrue the full 40 hours of leave by the end of the 12 month period, a part-time worker may not, rather, and rather would have accrued fewer than full, the full 40 hours. The amount of leave for part-time employees is just based on the number of hours that the employee worked. For example, we have employee A, if you can see on your screen, and employee A works 15 hours a week for 52 hours per year. So employee A will accrue 19.5 hours of paid leave annually. You can see 15 hours per week times 52 weeks per year is 780 hours worked per year. And then you divide that by 40 hours and you get the 19.5 hours of paid leave. So the new proposed rules introduce another complication on this issue. Under the proposed rule, employees will accrue leave faster than the law requires. Accrual must be made on a fractual basis based on 15 minute work increments. For example, if an employee works 46 minutes, the employee will have access to leave accrued for a full hour. If the employee works at one hour and one minute, the employee will be considered to have worked one hour and 15 minutes. Unlike the traditional rounding used for wage and hour laws, which might round up or round down, Proposed regulations require that employers always round up, regardless of where the dividing on the dividing line, the time worked actually exists. On top of that, employees who are exempt from the overtime requirements of the Federal Fair Labor Standards Act are generally deemed to work 40 hours in each work week for purpose of paid leave time accrual. They regularly work 40 hours or more in a work week. If such employees regular work week is less than 40 hours, their paid time leave paid leave time accrues based on the number of hours in the regular work week as previously explained in the example, the part-time example. 
So if the standard work week is 37 and a half hours, the employee works for and in, the employee works for 75 hours on a biweekly pay period, they'll accrue 1.875 hours of paid leave. So okay. now we know how accrual works. Mm -hmm. When can employees start accruing paid leave? Okay, so under the accrual method, each employee's paid leave begins accruing upon either the employee's beginning employment in 2024 or on January 1st, 2024, whichever is later. A few examples here. You can see on your screen again. First example, employee A has worked for their employer since 2019, but did not previously get paid leave. Employee A will begin accruing paid leave beginning January 1st, 2024. For second example, employee B has worked for their employer since 2019 and previously received paid leave. Employee will begin accruing paid leave beginning January 1st, 2024. And there's a third example here, employee C. Employee C begins employment on July 1st, 2024. So employee begins accruing paid leave on the first day of employment, which would be July 20, July 1st, 2024. Note that we're going to use these three examples again a few times in this presentation. So. so now let's discuss when employees can start using that earned accrued paid leave. Right. So while they begin accruing paid leave right away, after the act takes effect, employees will be entitled to begin using accrued paid leave after 90 days. So 90 days after the commencement of their employment or 90 days after January 1st, 2024. Well, you're gonna see right now the same three examples that we just went over on your screen. Let's go through them to see how this works. So for example one, employee A has worked for their employer since 2019, but did not, oh, but did not previously get paid leave. Employee A will begin accruing paid leave beginning January 1st, 2024, but must visit or wait to begin using earned paid leave until March 31st, 2024, 90 days later. Example two, employee B has worked for their employer since 2019 also, and has previously received paid leave. It's still the same thing again. Employee B will begin accruing paid leave beginning January 1st, 2024, 24, but must wait to begin using earned paid leave March 31st, 2024, 90 days later. Same thing again. Now we'll see in example three that since employee C begins employment later in the year, July 1st, 2024, employee begins accruing paid leave on his or her first day of employment, July 1st, 2024, but has to wait 90 days until September 29th before he using actually using any of the accrued paid leave can an employee carry over any accrued paid leave that's not used in the previous 12 month period under the accrual method so we're still on the accrual method um employers must and i repeat must allow employees to carry over all unused paid leave from one 12 month period yeah. to the next while the act has first passed well, when the act was first passed, we thought that it might be possible to cap total paid leave for all workers act leave at 40 hours and suspend future accruals until the employee had less than 40 hours. In other words, new leave would simply top up to the amount of 40 hours. However, there's a catch here. So the proposed regulations indicate that, and I'm Quoting here, employers may establish a reasonable policy restricting employees' ability to carry over more than 40 hours or more than 80 hours, excuse me, of unused paid leave. So at this point, the regulations do not provide any additional detail about the ability to impose a carryover cap, but another spoiler, spoiler alert, employers covered under the new Chicago paid leave law will have different outcomes. Can an employer institute a longer paid leave accrual introductory period than that under the act? No, absolutely not. Paid leave must begin accruing no later than 90 days after the hire date, or must be begin accruing 
right away and then can be used no late earlier or no later earlier than 90 days after their higher date or 90 days after January 1st, 2024, whatever's later. So to clarify that, we'll, we'll give you some, a little example here. So an employee cannot continue a one year post-employment introductory timeframe for paid leave to start occurring or beginning use to be used by the employee. The paid leave has to begin accruing right away and can, must be able to be used 90 days after the first day of employment or January 1st, 2024. So can employers uh, designate any flexibility in their 12 month paid leave accrual period? Yes. So some employers already offer their employees paid leave and use a different 12 month period. For example, um, using a work anniversary date, uh, the employer's fiscal year or health plan year or some other 12 month period other than starting on the first day of the year. Under the act, the 12 month period may be any consecutive 12 month period designated by the employer in writing at the time of hire upon no or upon notice prior to the change. So to use a different 12 month period rather than starting over at January 1st, 2024, there are a few requirements. First, the accrual period must cover the 12 uh, a 12 consecutive month period. The accrual rate still must not be less than one hour of paid leave for every 40 hours worked. And to use a different um, 12 month period than starting January 1st, 2024, the employer must provide written notice to its employees before January 1st, 2024 or at the time of hire, if it's after 20, January 1st, 2024. And this notice, written notice, must explain that the employer is using a specific 12 month period for paid leave accrual. And the employer must provide its current employees with documentation of the balance of hours worked, paid leave accrued and taken, and the remaining paid leave out balance of hours left at the time of the notice of the change. So under these proposed rules, employers must report the employee's paid leave accrual and remaining balance on each paycheck and provide these records to employees upon request. Alternatively, employers may report the accrual and balance on the form that the employer normally uses to notify the employee of wage payments and deduction, dedu deductions from wages. This requires close continuation with your payroll co consultation with your current payroll vendor. So does this mean that an employer can no longer front load paid leave at the beginning of the year? Right, no, of course not. So just like I was saying earlier, there's two ways to do it, accrual method and front loading method. So they can continue front loading paid leave if they do choose to do so. So let's talk about the front loading method. Under this front loading method, employees, employers can take the minimum 40 hours of annual paid leave and make it available to their employees the first day of employment or the first day of their 12 month accru annual accrual period. So all employees still have that 90 day waiting period from January 1st, 2024 or the first day of their employment um, to start using their accrued or their, the paid leave that they're given under the front-loading method. Additionally, under this method, employers are not required to allow employees to carry over paid leave and may require employees to use all leave prior to the end of the year or forfeit the, any unused paid leave. So employers using this front-loading method cannot forget to track the actual hours worked by each employee because if an employee would have received more paid leave under the accrual method, then the employer must provide that additional time. So do employers have any flexibility in designating the 12 month paid leave period under this front loading method? Yes. So if an employer wishes to use a different 12 month period other than the beginning of the calendar year under this front loading method, the employer still has to meet similar requirements as that under the accrual method. So first, the front loading period still has to cover 12 consecutive months and the paid, the front loaded paid leave must be at least 40 hours. Another 
requirement is that the employer must provide written notice again that to its employees. And I'll emphasize one more time before January 1st, 2024, it has to be before that all the uh, explaining that the employer is using a specific 12 month period of paid leave other than starting January 1st. And then the employer must also provide its current employees with documentation of the balance of hours worked, paid leave taken, and the remaining paid leave balance at the time of the notice of the change. So that's kind of a little bit about the flexibility of designating the 12 month period. So are employers able to set a minimum number of paid leave hours that an employee can use in a day? Yeah. So yes, they can. But while employees may determine what when they use the paid leave and how much they actually use in their reserved accrued or reserves front loaded, um, employers may set a maximum or minimum leave increment of up to two hours per day. So in other words, an employer may require that an employee use at least two hours of paid leave on any given single day even if they're stepping out for about 30 minutes. So it's a two hour increment that must be taken. Um, so a quick example of that, the employer has a doctor appointment, needs only one hour. If the employer does set that two minimum paid leave requirement, the employee will use two full hours of paid leave for that doctor appointment. Um, and that's just kind of how it goes. It's just two hours, increment or less. Can't, can't be more than that. Are there any notice or record keeping requirements under the act? Yes. So you probably won't be surprised that there are many requirements here. So under the act, employers must satisfy a few notice requirements. Um, they have to post an Illinois Department of Labor provided notice in a conspicuous place in the work on the work premises and include a copy of the notice in a written document, manual or employee manual or handbook or policy. The notice has to be provided in English and any other language, any and all other languages commonly spoken in the workplace. Um, they can, for their policies, they can provide, must provide a written policy that contains notice procedures for employees if they, the employer already has a policy or requires policies. Um, for record keeping, they have to maintain accurate records showing the number of hours work, the paid leave accrued and used, and any remaining leave balance. And these proposed regulations require several additional requirements. So the new proposed regulations that the Illinois Department of Labor just provided to us. So they um, require that employers provide employees with paid leave policy prior to or upon commencement of employment or within 90 days after the effective date of the act. And employers that regularly communicate with employees by electronic means must provide the notice by the, this regular electronic method. Um, they must also post a statement written by the employer summarizing the employer's written policy and how an employee can obtain a copy of this policy document. The statement has to be provided in, in English and any other language commonly spoken in the workplace. They are required to report the employee's paid leave accrual and a remaining balance on each pay stub and provide these records to the employee upon request. So it, alternatively to re doing the reporting of the paid leave accrued and remaining balance on pay stubs, employers can report the, actu the accrual and balance, the accrued paid leave and the remaining balance on the form that the employer normally uses to notify an employer of wage payments and deductions of wages, deductions from wages, sorry. Um, the records have to be kept for at least three years and have to be available for inspection by the Illinois Department of Labor. And then if an employer uses the accrual method, the employer has to keep the records for three years and for it to be available for the employee upon request. 
Will paid leave provided under the Act be required to be paid out upon an employee's termination or resignation or retirement? So this depends. Um, employers, if the employers address the Paid Leave for All Workers Act in a separate policy, the accrued and unused Paid Leave for All Workers Act days do not have to be paid out at termination. However, the Paid Leave for All Workers Act or you know, the leave under the Paid Leave for All Workers Act is provided under broader paid time off or vacation accounts, then it will have to be paid out upon termination. So if the employer is obligated to pay an employee unused accrued paid leave upon termination, resignation, or retirement, there are two considerations under the Paid Leave for All Workers Act. One, if the employer elects to use the front-loading method, and the employee uses all of their leave and then quits before the end of the 12 month period, the employer does not have to pay the employee any unused paid leave. So also in this scenario, um, an employer may not make the employee re repay paid leave time as benefits that have already been provided may not be retroactively diminished. So if you front loaded, you gave the employee 40 hours, and they only used half of that, 20, you don't. You cannot require the employee to pay you back for those 20 hours you gave them that they didn't use by the end of the year. Another consideration um, is, you know, on the other hand, if the employer elects to use the accrual method and the employer lets an employee borrow against future accrual, meaning the employee's paid leave balance goes negative, then the employee quits while the paid leave balance is still negative, then the, the, in this scenario, then the employer may make the employee repay any and all borrowed accrued leave. So, and like really want to emphasize that this is only if the employer includes a future accrual borrowing provision in their written paid leave policy that also allows for the employee's repayment of borrowed accrued leave and the employee agrees to that policy in writing prior to taking any leave. So Andy, I'll let you jump back in here. What about counties and cities that already have an ordinance regarding paid leave? Which one do employers have to follow? Well, in general, the act says that if you are in a jurisdiction that already has some form of paid leave that is in effect as of December 31 of 23, you follow the terms of that law. Now, what does this mean in practice? It means that if you are in Cook County and your local government is subject to the earned sick leave ordinance, you follow that. If you're in the city of Chicago, you follow their law. But if you're in Cook County, in a city that has opted out of the county sick leave ordinance, you're going to have to introduce and comply with the Illinois Paid Leave Act. And that leads to Chicago, right? I mean, uh, the dominant force in our state. And uh, we'll talk about what's going on there. Now, this is a family-friendly webinar. We realize there may be small children listening in with their parents to this program. So I'm not going to use some of the terms that some of my clients have shared when they're trying to grapple with how their businesses are going to comply with these new laws. I'm a movie buff. And at first I thought, well, it could be dumb and dumber, but no, I'm not sure that's right because I, I think, you know, I'm going to borrow from one of my favorite movies, the a Legend of Ricky Bobby. And as Ricky Bobby is famous for saying, if you're not first, you're last. And so the city of Chicago doesn't want to be last to anybody. And so they have introduced what will be the most generous paid leave law in the United States of America. Now, they did all this starting November 9. And businesses were told, you've got to update all of your leave policies by December 31. And breaking news two days ago on December 13, 
the Chicago City Council voted to delay their paid leave changes until July 1, 2024. Now, why is this a big deal? And why are we talking about doubling down? Because the city of Chicago has had for several years a paid sick leave law that requires basically all employers to provide 40 hours of paid sick leave to covered employees within the city. When they got wind of the new state law, they decided that let's give some paid leave on top of our sick leave. So what's new about Chicago is that in addition to the paid sick leave requirements of 40 hours per year, you have to give full-time employees another 40 hours of paid leave that they can use essentially for any reason, be it extra sick leave or just as vacation. And this ordinance will replace the current paid sick leave ordinance on July 1. Um, and again, it, it applies to any employer who has at least one employee with, you know, working in Chicago. Now, what does it mean to work in Chicago? I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, and there are variations. If you're a small employer, <clears throat> meaning less than 50, you're subject to less restrictive rules. If you're a medium employer, which means you have between 51 and 100 employees, you have a greater set of rules. And if you're over 100, Katie, bar the door, uh, you're subject to the full Monty of the law. Now, there was one silver lining, if you can call it that, when the city council pushed back the effective date to July 1. And in doing that, they changed who is a covered employee. Because on November 9, when this law was passed, they said a covered employee is any employee who spends at least two hours in any given work week performing work within the city limits, which would, if introduced in that language, expand the universe of covered employers to a number of businesses who thought they would never be subject to Chicago employment laws. The city has walked that back a bit, but it's still a pretty ominous standard. And under the new standard, a covered employee is any individual who works at least 80 hours for an employer within any 120 day period while physically present within the geographic boundaries of the city of Chicago. Now, once the employee has reached that 80 hour threshold over any given 120 day period, they are a covered employee for the remainder of the time that the employee works for the employer. So, you know, if you have an organization and you might be loaning an employee, if you will, to cover for someone at a sister company in Chicago, if they're there for a sufficient number of hours, all of a sudden they get a boost from 40 days of general paid leave as an Illinois covered employee to 80 hours under the new Chicago paid leave law. Now the ordinance does not affect the validity or change the terms of any sick leave or PTO policy in a valid collective bargaining agreement that's in effect on July 1. And, uh, and generally, you know, some employees in the construction industry who are covered by certain collective bargaining agreements, meaning they're union workers, are exempt again on the assumption that those workers already enjoy probably more generous benefits under their union agreement. Now, employers will be free under the Chicago law um, to either front load or have an accrual method of earning time. And here's where Chicago has gone a bit off the rails in my view, and you know, or one glaring example, it's that as of July 1, employees will earn one hour of sick leave and one hour of paid leave 
for every 35 hours worked over any given 12 month period. And so if you have, you know, a store in Chicago with Chicago employees, you're going to have to use a slightly different payroll and calcul uh, calculation methodology based on a 35 hour work tranche as opposed to 40 hours for people right across the border in Lake or DuPage. Employers are hoping that this will be walked back between now and July 1, because right now sick leave is earned at a rate of one hour per 40 hours of work. And so why the city has compressed the earning standard is a bit of a mystery other than they want to give more benefits and more rights to employees. And for employers who are currently covered by Chicago sick leave, the 40 hour earning module will remain in effect until July 1, after which time the 35 hours will go into effect. And um, existing carryover provisions under the Chicago paid sick leave will still be applied. Now, what are any restrictions for the employees 40 hours of general paid leave? In many aspects, it's similar to Illinois paid leave. And there are some additional kickers to protect individuals who are absent due to violence to a family member, uh, where a, a family member is a victim of a crime or some assorted other reasons, but generally assume that it will be the same test as under Illinois. Now, in Chicago, employees must be permitted whether to choose to use general paid leave or paid leave prior to using any other leave provided by the employer under any other law or private policy. And it's not clear yet whether the city is going to allow the stacking of leave, if you will, uh, in these scenarios. And so watch this space. Uh, there will be a burst of activity or several bursts between now and July 1. However, there's a few guidelines that we that are in the law. You can prohibit employees from taking any general paid leave until after their 90th day of employment and any accrued paid sick and safe leave. Safe leave is essentially you need leave as a victim of a crime or as a someone who's experiencing uh, domestic violence that can be used after 30 days of employment. So isn't it nice that Illinois at least has one consistent 90 day standard before using if you're in Chicago and elsewhere and opt to have different policies, you're going to have to keep track of what of which buckets of time uh, an employee is using and when they are eligible. Um, you can require up to seven days notice and reasonable pre-approval to maintain continuity of operations before an employee takes general paid leave. Uh, unless you have an unlimited PTO policy, in which case you may not require pre-approval. Uh, you can require up to seven days notice of foreseeable sick and safe leave, i.e. pre-scheduled medical appointments or court dates. Otherwise, notice as soon as is practical, which will likely be day of for unforeseen sick and safe leave. Um, an employer can also require if an employee is absent for more than three consecutive work days, uh, you can have the employee certify that they have used sick and safe leave for a legally permitted reason. And there's a number of different forms of proof that an employer can uh, cover. Now, there are mandatory carryover provisions uh, employees who accrue leave time must be permitted to carry over up to 16 hours of unused general paid leave time and 80 hours of unused sick and safe leave into the following year. 
any additional unused accrued leave generally need not be carried over or paid out at the end of a 12-month accrual period. However, unused general paid leave must be paid out upon separation or, and this is another big difference between Chicago and the state, when an employee is transferred outside the city limits to another state. So if an employee changes their work location, let's say from Chicago to um, Wheaton in DuPage County, even though there's no break in employment, you've got to cash out their Chicago paid leave account, just as you would with vacation if there are uh, if there is a termination for any reason. Now, small employers under 50 don't have to do this payout. Medium-sized employers only have to pay out 16 hours of unused paid leave at separation, um, at least until July 1, 2025, after which they will also have to pay out the full amount of accrued and unused general paid leave and if you have an unlimited PTO policy, you don't get to walk away from a, a no payment at termination, which is one of the benefits for people who have existing unlimited PTO or vacation. You have to pay the monetary equivalent of 40 hours of paid time off minus the hours used by the employee during the relevant accrual year. And again, all of this applies um, upon termination for any reason or a transfer outside the city limits. There's very, very detailed record keeping requirements. Uh, we're happy to provide more information or you can read them yourself if you like reading full-blown ERISA plans or sections of the Internal Revenue Code. You'll love reading the city regulation. And there's another little twist uh, that is was made when they pushed back the start date to the paid leave statute. Under the Greater Chicago Municipal Code, they changed that so that employers must now provide workers with at least 14 days notice of any changes to employment policies. And this prevents employers from saying, we're changing our handbook effective tomorrow. Here's the new handbook. It looks like you're gonna to have to have a 14 day grace period or notice period before you make any changes. And as with the Illinois law, uh, you're going to have to provide the uh, policy and information in a language that is understandable to the worker. So if you have workers who speak, whose primary language is other than English, it's going to have to be uh, given to the worker in their native language. And there are uh, numerous enforcement provisions. There are private rights of action, needless to say, under the new Chicago law. It's going to keep employers and lawyers who represent employees and unions and lawyers who represent management very busy over the next few years as everyone tries to understand and keep up with this new law. So let's get to the consequences of not complying with this act. Um, okay, so for non-compliance with the act, the Illinois Department of Labor is charged with administering and enforcing the act. Um, employees may file complaints with the Illinois Department of Labor within three years of an alleged violation of under the act or alleged violation of the act and the Illinois Department of Labor may refer such violations to admin an administrative law judge to schedule a formal hearing. Employers that violate the act may also be subject to a civil suit by an affected employee for damages, including the amount of the actual underpayment, any other compensatory damages, and a penalty of $500 to $1,000. The act further allows employees to recover and appropriate equitable relief, as well as reasonable attorney's fees and expert witness fees. Additionally, employers will be subject to a $2,500 civil penalty for each separate offense. 
to be deposited into a special fund created in the state treasury dedicated to enforcing the act. There is a fear that the Paid Leave for All Workers Act could evolve into a windfall for plaintiff's lawyers, much like the Illinois Biometric Privacy Act. Um, so we've got, you know, a nice uh, Winston Churchill quote, you know, um, action this day. So what are the key takeaways here, right? Um, make sure you review and evaluate your existing current vacation and leave policies and decide how to integrate paid leave. Um, especially, this is especially important if you have an unlimited vacation policy. Decide on an accrual method or front-loading method or hybrid. Prepare notices and languages used by your employees and update employee handbooks. Um, address your, the management of employees based in Cook County in Chicago. Decide what to do with non-Illinois employees or ask for advice from an attorney. Um, consult with your attorneys regarding the entirety of this act and how paid leave or how it applies to you. Um, because just as Andy was saying earlier, even if you already have uh, an established policy that complies with the minimum requirements for existing policies on the act and doesn't have to be changed further, the act also provides that the ordinances that your local city and state or in county ordinances, if they are established, may override the act. And, you know, you have to comply with the state and local ordinance and not just the act. Make sure you talk to an attorney about where you stand. Um, and then remember that the December 31st and July 1st are the deadlines for the new Chicago paid sick leave and um, paid leave. Uh, uh, they're just for the for the new ordinance to come into play and for the new Illinois Paid Leave for All Workers Act to come into play. So not surprisingly, that was a lot of information. So we've got some questions that have come in throughout mm -hmm. the presentation. So we have a little time left, so we will try to address as many as we can get to. So let's get to the first one here. Can an employer deny Paid leave for all workers act leave. You know, I'll I'll take that one, Amy and Madeline. Uh, yes, uh, the the act in its original language under Section 15H, it permits employers to have the prior notice requirements that we've talked about, uh, and it, and those prior notice requirements hinge on whether leave is foreseeable, i.e., we're going on a family vacation. Uh, or unforeseeable, I woke up and I tested positive for COVID, or uh, I had a family emergency, uh, where the standard is give notice as soon as, as possible. Uh, you cannot deny leave simply because the request does not meet the company's own foreseeability and notice requirements. However, the new rules create a sliver of an opening for companies that want to say, hey, it is our busy season and nobody can take time off during this window of time. Now, again, it's a sliver of an opening, but the bar that is in place right now, it will depend, you know, kind of as follows. And, and this is on, you know, a legitimate assessment of the company's operational needs. But here's the standard. And this could be a real problem for most private employers. Does the company provide a need or service that is critical to the health, safety, or welfare of the people of Illinois? Now, you know, read literally, you might think, you know, if you're in the business of, uh, you know, you know, making sporting goods equipment, is that mission critical? Uh, maybe not. Uh, but if you're, you know, supplying medical equipment that is needed for Illinois hospitals, first responders, perhaps yes. 
Uh, does it mean if you're in a busy season at work because tax filings are due? Not sure that applies, but we do have this to remember that the definition, if we look back to COVID and folks, it wasn't that long ago, um, there was a much broader uh, scope of companies that were viewed to have critical importance. Uh, and, and this included like law firms, for example, and other professional service firms that I think many folks thought probably wouldn't be classified in this category. So use this with care. The other standards are going to be easier to reach if once you get over this mission critical test, and that is whether other similarly situated employees are treated the same for purposes of uh, giving a thumbs up or thumbs down to paid leave, and whether uh, granting leave during that time frame would significantly impact your operation because you're a small size. So if you're a mega corporation and you have 10,000 employees Illinois, in Illinois, and uh, you're missing one person in a factory, but you have 300 other factory workers, probably not. But if you're in a mom and pop operation and that person is your only person involved in making your widgets, that would be more disruptive and you might be able to satisfy that last test. And then, of course, you have to make sure that the employee has an adequate opportunity to use all of their paid leave that they are entitled to receive over a 12 month period. So, you know, again, there's a there's hope, but be very careful before you decide to try to exercise this option. We've got another question here. If an employee requests sick leave prior to using all 40 hours of paid leave, will the sick leave use up the paid leave? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll kind of jump in on this one as well, Amy and Madeline. Yes. Uh, if you've got your policies written right and you offer extra paid sick leave, you can uh, say that paid sick leave, for example, can only be used upon exhaustion of uh, statutory leave and the same thing for vacation. Paid sick leave is not in addition to paid leave. And this is why we think it's a good idea to evaluate your current policies to see where you can, you know, create some different boundary lines. And again, for people outside of Chicago, avoid having to pay out accrued and unused general Illinois paid leave. Great. That pretty much takes us up to our time. Uh, so I want to thank you, panelists, Andy and Madeline, once again, for supplying us with valuable and very timely information. Thank you listeners for attending today. And if you have any concerns with how these laws apply to you, you can contact our speakers directly if you need additional assistance. I've put their contact information on the screen. And that wraps up our series for the year. Check your inbox or our social media pages for details on future webinars. And we hope you have a great rest of your day and happy new year.